we all come from somewhere. My name is Brian, and along with my brother Terence, we embarked on a journey to Ireland to explore our family heritage and visit a bunch of places associated with our last name, O'Toole. The problem is, it was just a visit. After finding time in our busy work schedules, we finally found ourselves at JFK Airport. Ready to go to Ireland, baby. I'm just getting warm. I'm not a chugger. What is, what is, what's the cheese? Solange? Solange. 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 Well, at least that makes one of us. And with that, it was shamrocks, a whole lot of subpar snacks, and an early morning Dublin sunrise. We have arrived in the land of the green. Time to grab our bags, remind our taxi driver to drive on the left if he didn't already know, and try to get some sleep. It was like five in the morning. We roll up into the hotel, we're checking in, and there's a Guinness tap. Like, no joke, like, I could have reached it. At the counter. At, At the, the counter. counter. At the checking counter. We need to go to sleep right now because we need to wake up to drink Guinness. Yeah, what was it, 10 a.m.? At 10 a.m. Yeah. I'm very surprised we did not have yeah, Guinness. I think we were just tired. So before we really dig in, we just want to let everybody know how completely different this video is from what we normally do. In other words, if you're here for detailed information about places we visited, there's 18 other videos from this trip you can watch. This is going to be a little more personal. The Guinness Storehouse was right around the corner, according to Brian, which wound up turning into you know, a 45 minute walk, which is not a problem if you know you're going on a 45 minute walk. Jet lagged, yeah, barely sleeping, yeah, uh, nothing in the stomach in terms of energy, coffee, or anything for that matter. We were fine. And why did we need to drink Guinness at 10 a.m.? Because that was our reserve time. That's what you get for buying tickets last minute for the most visited attraction in Dublin. Also, Terence doesn't really like stouts, so this is going to be interesting. The Guinness Storehouse is a worthwhile visit just unto itself. A self-guided tour through seven floors around a glass atrium, shaped as a pint of Guinness. Check out how the beer is made, learn how to pour the perfect pint, or, you know, check out a fish on a bicycle. The real treat is the top floor, known as the Gravity Bar. Dublin's highest drinking establishment, where you'll get surrounding views of the whole city while drinking the finest black liquid in the land. Just remember, you'll need to wait almost two minutes before it's ready. For five years, I've been hearing a story about the uh, dog water that is American-made Guinness or American-served Guinness, and it was nothing like that. I, I, there's no Guinness that I tasted like that before in my life. And it's immediately afterwards, I looked at him and went, you really weren't lying. It was lighter, it was creamier, it was delicious. I also had our sister in her head who goes, you know, you drink Guinness and you're gonna poop black for a week, uh, which was not the case. Not once was my poop black. Eventually, we needed to eat. But aside from a small cafe with snacks, all of the actual eateries within Guinness weren't open yet. So we had to find food elsewhere. We decided to head to the Brazen Head, the oldest pub in Dublin, where we filled up on stew and fish and chips and more beer. There's no dispute that it's one of the oldest bars it's in Dublin old. or in Ireland, but it's, yeah, it was old. It's like a thousand the, years old. I thought the booth we were sitting was easily older than me. And then, just like that, we were asleep again at the hotel. Who didn't see that coming? We overestimated the amount of sleep we got because it wasn't enough. <laughs> When we woke up, we did what any sensible set of still sleep-deprived American gentlemen would do. We went looking for more alcohol. This time at Bow Street, the location of Jameson Distillery, where we took a whiskey tasting tour. Much more intimate than Guinness and involving a tour guide, we spun little glasses through our fingers and tried three different Jameson whiskeys while we learned about how it's all made. For both of us not being whiskey aficionados, it was still a really fun experience, and we deeply regret not buying that can't-find-it-back-at-home bottle of Crested. After a post-tour drink at their bar, a very tasty ginger and lime, we burst out into the Dublin streets in search of live music. 
And oh, did we find it at a pub called McNeil's. This place was banging. No fuss, no stage, no big band. Just two guys sitting in the middle of everyone and playing their hearts out. It was almost like a welcoming home to everyone. This is like, like was, a, was I, a great first this date. country is someone's house and we just got invited to sit on the couch. And how nice of them to do this. Yeah. There was points in the song where the singer would go to solo and the place goes dead quiet. I mean, you could hear a mouse fart type of thing, right? And this guy's soloing and you feel like he's on, the, he's on stage going for a Grammy or something like he's, this is the performance of his lifetime, yep. but this is literally a Friday night for him. McNeil's is also where I found an unexpected ally. This guy was on the other side of Terrence and he was talking to us. So Terrence tells him the story that we had told earlier about how I have not had a Guinness for five years and I refuse to drink it unless I'm in Ireland. And he goes, of course. When I'm in Spain, I drink Estrella. When I'm in Netherlands, I drink Heineken. And when I'm in Dublin, I drink Guinness. Why the hell would I drink it anywhere else? And with that, we floated off into the night, ate some donor kebabs, and went to bed. Day three started pretty much the same as day two, in search of booze. I'm kidding. Today we're actually going to start visiting stuff. Still full from the late night kebabs, we headed out into the streets. Before long, we came upon the Spire of Dublin, a giant stainless steel monument on O'Connell Street, Dublin's main thoroughfare. That spire was pretty cool. Um, it's just a spire, so aside from learning what's behind it, it's a big metal pole that looks like a needle, you know, that's, that's, that's it. Uh, which it's cool to see when you're up and you're looking at it, you're just, that's a big hole. <laughs> we then used our multi-day city pass for the hop on hop off bus. The city pass gives access to a whole slew of attractions throughout the city with just a quick barcode scan on your phone. It's cheaper than purchasing tickets a la carte and saves you time from having to buy tickets for each place. Our Guinness and Jameson visits yesterday City Pass. Almost everything we're doing today and tomorrow? City Pass. Not only was this a great way to see the city, but we shaved many would-be miles off our feet too. We saw the Daniel O'Connell statue and the General Post Office, or GPO, among other things. Our first destination was Dublin Castle, the historic heart of Dublin. Constructed in the 13th century, the architecture here was pretty cool. You can walk through the courtyard, take a stroll through the gardens, check out one of the oldest structures in the city, the medieval tower, or head inside to the state apartments. Inside, you'll find all kinds of lavish rooms and corridors, and even St. Patrick's Hall, where all nine Irish presidents and members of parliament have been inaugurated. There was also a temporary Irish glass exhibition in the Coach House Gallery that we checked out, featuring the works of various innovative glass artists. Now ravenous, we stopped inside the fourth corner, where we ate smash burgers and fries and fired up some good conversations with locals. Fourth corner bar was where you met the guy the who was in love was... with Captain like... America. We were talking to him for a long time, and he was telling us about Glendalough and make sure you go here and make sure you see this. And We will visit Glendalough, a nearby national park and monastic city, but not today. Next up was St. Patrick's Cathedral, one of the most important pilgrimage sites in the country, and our next destination. Founded in 1191 and constructed between 1220 and 1260, the architecture is stunning inside and out, and is one of the most beautiful cathedrals I think I have ever visited. This place was just unbelievable. If anyone is familiar with the writer Jonathan Swift, you know, Gulliver's Travels, Modest Proposal, Yes, that guy. He was a dean here, and this is the pulpit where he preached. He's also buried within the cathedral. We then walked a few minutes to Christ Church Cathedral, the home of the Archbishop of Dublin. Originally a wooden church and founded by Vikings, it's now a beautiful cathedral with medieval tiled floors, vaulted ceilings, and prominent arches. Built in 1030, it's also the oldest structure in Dublin. 
Christ Church, I really wanted to bring you to, even more so than St. Patrick's, because St. Patrick's is the famous cathedral, but Christ Church is where our ancestor that I have actually been able to tie, genealogically speaking, to us, St. Lawrence O'Toole. Yeah. I mean, that was like important. That was important to go to that site and be like, okay, this is at the heart of St. Lawrence O'Toole. This is the church, you know? So that was kind of cool. You know, I mean, like we don't know the guy from sideways. At the suggestion of our local superhero friend, we headed to Darkie Kelly's bar. We needed live music and we needed it now. And oh, did we get it all right? A beer didn't hurt either. Being that we were in the Temple Bar area, a center of largely tourist nightlife in Dublin, we decided to head to its most famous destination, the Temple Bar Pub. We got some ham and cheese toasties, we got some beer, we got to hear some more banging Irish music. At some point, we made one last stop at a spot called Shin A on the River Liffey. No music, unfortunately, but we met a hilarious local comedian named Oshian, who was practicing his bits on us. And after that, ended our night. Woken by a terrible hunger, we indulged ourselves at a place called Slattery's just downstairs from our hotel that Anthony Bourdain apparently enjoyed. The heart attack that is the Irish breakfast is definitely not for the timid, and we devoured it heartily, especially those thick bacon slabs. Bloated but happy, we hurried down the River Liffey because of imminent rain and soon arrived at the Genie Johnston, a replica of the famine ship that sailed to North America during the Great Famine and safely brought over thousands of Irish. During the tour, our guide told the stories of many of the notable passengers and crew members. For me, learning about the ship and what people were going through and then tying that to what our great grand great great grandfather great grandfather did. He did it a couple times. Yeah. yeah, this guy was crazy. Just three, four trips across the Atlantic. Yeah, uh, linking seeing the ship and linking that to what turns out the ship that he was on was not. It as, was a lot. It was a lot nicer. It was because, a little more modern. It was a little more modern. But the fact that he he came over here to New York, sort of set up shop for himself, and then went back and brought people back with him. Yeah. I mean, like at that time, like I can't even imagine that. That's that's just crazy. Afterwards, we crossed the street to visit Epic, the Irish Immigration Museum. This place is an absolute must for anyone with Irish heritage, because, after all, we all come from somewhere. Ranging from literature, science, music, dancing, and more across 20 interactive galleries, the museum focuses on the significant contributions of the Irish diaspora around the world. It was pretty neat to add our great-grandfather to the legacy wall. Also, right across the street, we briefly checked out the Famine Memorial, created to commemorate the Great Famine, also known as Angorta Moor, when over one million Irish died and a million more left because of a terrible potato blight, a food that nearly one-third of the Irish population depended on to survive. Arguably no other singular event, and believe me, there were many to follow, affected Ireland more than the Great Famine. Speaking of significant historical events, our next stop, also right along the River Liffey, is the Custom House, which was almost completely burned down in 1921 by the Irish Republican Army, the IRA. This was the most significant act of rebellion in the country since the 1916 Easter Rising. Now used to house government offices and a museum, exhibits inside reveal the planning behind the burning by notable Irish revolutionary figures, Michael Collins, and Amon de Valera. Dublin is not a normal city in the sense of like, you don't go there and like, of course there's people there, there's restaurants, there's pubs, there's attractions and what have you, but it's a living historical city. Our next stop was Trinity College, Ireland's oldest university, which is situated on 47 acres in the center of the city. One of the more prominent places to see outside is Parliament Square, where you can check out the Campanile, this very hard to miss bell tower. Here, we were hoping to snag tickets to see the Book of Kells. I went up to the woman yeah. and said she's like, it said, sold, it, it out said the sold out on the sign. And I guess this is a, this is a suggestion for anyone, I guess in the world, like it doesn't hurt to ask. Um, I asked the woman, oh, oh, it's sold out. She's like, actually, 
Yeah, there's two of you. Are you ready to go right now? Yeah. She's like, I'll get you in right now. And we went right now? Yeah. Talk about being lucky. The Book of Kells is a 1,200-year-old illustrated and illuminated manuscript of the four Gospels, and every day, they turn a page. It's enclosed in a glass exhibit, and no photography or videography of any kind is allowed. But there are public images, which we just showed. Afterwards, you get to check out the main chamber of the old library and what's called the Long Room, which houses over 200,000 books. This looks like a cathedral. It's just stunning. Shakespeare's first folio, the oldest surviving harp in Ireland, a copy of the Proclamation of the Irish Republic, a place of study for writers Oscar Wilde, Jonathan Swift, and Samuel Beckett. Yeah, this place is amazing. It did suck that the, the library is under reconstruction, though, because they were emptying some of the shelves of the books. So as you look towards the back... Yeah, at first you didn't notice that you see all these books, you don't have this, like, you know... This is insane. This bookshelf's 50 feet up, you're climbing the yeah. ladders, and then, like... But then you go to the back... Three rows later, there's nothing. It's just empty. Yeah. <laughs> like, so if we were to go back in a, a couple of years, like, it would I'm be sure. again. At this point, it was time to eat. And before we could figure out what we wanted, an answer appeared. Mongolian barbecue. You gotta remember, this is Dublin. It's an international city. It's not that we didn't want to eat fish and chips and stew and Dublin coddle all the time, you know. But we're from New York. We like to try everything. And I had never tried this. I love being able to pick everything and your soft air, like it was just very customizable. I had, I remember I got like three bowls. I, I ate Brian, so much. You would've thought he didn't eat for the last two days. Yeah. Anyone want to figure out where we went next? Uh, every night we were in Dublin, live music. Because we were passing through Temple Bar, we popped into a spot called the Vat House. They were playing music. That was enough, honestly. But they did also happen to have beer. After a pint or two, we decided on an early night since we were leaving Dublin in the morning. On our way back to our hotel, we crossed the Haypenny Bridge, the first pedestrian bridge in Dublin that used to cost a half penny to cross. The next morning, we took a taxi to the airport to get our rental car. No need for one in Dublin, but now we were about to head out into the wild. But first, traffic circles, or as they say here, roundabouts. What's that one? Roundabouts are probably one of the harder things to wrap your head around as you drive on the opposite side of the road, sitting in the opposite side of a car, turning in the opposite direction. Terrence is a pro, though. It took him just a little bit to get used to it. And this is rain. Why is this rain important, you may ask? Because it was during this rain that the Just Miss Brothers were born. Uh, we outran the rain, or... Uh came before them. Yeah, we just missed it. We just missed the rain in we every opportunity. Whether in the rental car, inside a pub, or hiding in a utility shack. Yeah, we'll show you that later. There was never a moment during the trip where we found ourselves soaking wet and miserable. We always just missed it. Also, little did I know this at the time, but I would never drive on this trip. Not once. My, my experience was having the joy of driving through this beautiful country and just soaking in the atmosphere that was Ireland. Like, I highly recommend if you're going to tour Ireland and you don't want to drive, go on a bus tour, let them do it for you, that's fine. I'm one of those people that is just as content driving around a space, seeing how marvelous it is, versus stopping and doing things. Eventually, we reached our accommodations in a very tiny town called Duncanealy in County Donegal which had taken us about three hours to reach. The Airbnb we stayed in, uh, you know, it was beautiful to look outside. It was it was really idyllic and nice. Oh, yeah, the views out the back. Yeah, it was, it was very nice. But in terms of like vibrant downtown scene now, I mean, you had to kind of leave. We got some fish and chips and gusions at the local takeaway. Takeaway is how they say takeout here. We then had a pint at possibly the unfriendliest bar in Ireland, and I'll leave it at that, before heading off for a good night's sleep in preparation for my most anticipated day of the entire trip.
Before the trip, I told Terrence, I don't care what you do, sit in a pub, take a nap, read a book about insects, but I'm hiking across the Sleeve League. Located along the wild Atlantic Way, the Sleeve League Cliffs are the highest accessible sea cliffs in all of Europe. After parking in the paid lot, we begin walking up a slightly steep paved road towards the viewpoint. It's about a kilometer and is filled with beautiful scenery, and of course, sheep. There are pretty much no people either, except one man and his dog, who we talk to. Every every morning he brings his dog for this hike. Yeah. He goes up to the viewpoint and comes down, and his so, dog's off leash. His dog, what a life. There's that lake that's up there, or the pond, we're going to call it. His dog goes swimming in it every morning. Before long, we reached Bungless Point, the viewing area for the Sleeve Leaf Cliffs. You can say no words and walk the whole thing and go to the viewpoint, and all you're doing is looking in awe at this beautiful, beautiful place. Yeah. That seems like it's untouched by man. Yep. It really is an incredible place, and it was an all too familiar feeling for me. Five years ago, at this very viewpoint, I remember looking at Greyhound and saying, if we ever come back, we're hiking up that. And with that, I bid farewell to my dear brother and began my ascent upwards. Right from the start, it was very steep and felt like it would never end. I was patting myself on the back though. I felt really, really good. Despite pounding beers in Dublin our very first day, I really focused on taking care of myself for the few days preceding this because I didn't want to diminish the enjoyment of this bucket list hike. You know what I didn't focus on this beautiful morning? Putting sunscreen on. Stay tuned for that. The feeling I got from reaching the upper portion of the cliffs was pretty exhilarating. It was very windy, but it was also absolutely magnificent. It is sick up here. It is so sick. I don't know if I'm in the minority here, but I actually prefer hiking alone and I generally avoid heavily trafficked trails when I can, or at least try to begin them earlier than most people. The fact that I wouldn't see a person for hours was really special. There's nothing better than not having to talk to anyone and just taking in everything around you. As I continued across the cliffs, the terrain became much less friendly and the wind was blistering. These cliffs do tower 1,972 feet over the Atlantic Ocean. So, not feeling any wind would be weird, right? As soon as I saw those series of cliff peaks up ahead, I felt a little turn in my stomach. It's known as the One Man's Pass, a very narrow, sharp-edged rock path that anyone attempting should take great care so as to not, you know, fall and kill themselves. If you're afraid of heights, it's not something you should attempt. The problem is that I'm afraid of heights. And while I still can't get on a ladder to get on my roof back home, I still try to battle through my fears from time to time. I seized up right here, turning around to collect myself. The wind was violent. My legs were loose and wobbly. I'd been here before. You've got this, I told myself. You've done this before. It wasn't enough. I turned around and with every step downwards, I felt this wonderful feeling of weightlessness and euphoria. I knew that I would live. Unlike other summits back home, like Emory Peak or the mighty Katahdin, where I initially froze in place, but rallied the troops and turned around to finish the job, I couldn't do that today. Not here, and definitely not by myself. Miss you, Greyhound. Thankfully, I had a plan B. There's a much easier route to the top of the cliffs called the Pilgrim's Path that starts in the town of Teeland. It was supposed to be my return route, but now it's my only remaining option. It was also here that I finally saw other people. Before long, I had made it up to the top of the Grey Mountain. These views really are incredible. I'm so grateful for not only being able to hike this, but that Terrence understood why I needed to. These are all the people that you met on your walk. Hi! Say hello everyone! Connor, say hi! Hi! hi. I'm from New York. Do you not fall? I won't fall. And because I'm persistent, I decided to head to the one man's path on the path I was supposed to take. I really wanted to see it. 
Not only did I see it, but I was able to see two people actually do it. Watching them slowly climb the narrow stretch made me feel very uncomfortable, though. We had a nice chat afterwards about it, and I even sent them the footage. If you two ever see this video, your balls are huge. At this point, I began heading back down the Pilgrim's Path. Terrence and I booked a tour of the Sleeve League a little later. You can actually see the pier in Teelan where we'll depart from. The views of the valley going down were superb. Eventually, I reached the end of the trail. Within spitting distance was the Rusty Mackerel, a really good gastropub. Drinking a pint of the black stuff and some delicious food while I wearily gazed at what I just hiked was very satisfying. Eventually, we made our way to the pier to board our boat. One of the first things you'll see is an old tower that was built as part of a signal system to warn of a potential French invasion by Napoleon. Shortly thereafter, the Sleeve League will come into view. And then, to see it do the other side of the coin and take a boat tour and see it from the bottom was even more jarring, because like you're up there and you're going, this is magnificent, this little yeah. glory that it is, this, this natural creation. And then it really comes full circle when you're down at the bottom of it, on the water, looking up at where you were earlier that day. And you're like, that, oh, that's, that's a big piece of rock. Down that way is Malenbeg, where you can faintly see another signal tower. We'll head there tomorrow. Wear sunscreen. sunscreen. Wear sunscreen, wear sunscreen, if you're wear fair sunscreen. Skin, like most Irish people. Oh, that was a mistake. He got burned up top, and then we're like, yo, let's go on a boat with nothing overhead, the reflection of the sun coming yeah. off the water, it being one of the hottest. I was so day. red. Insert wife joke about how husbands shouldn't go on vacation by themselves. On the tour, we saw dolphins, which was a bit of a surprise. Afterwards, we headed back to our lodging and called it a day. Thankfully, my legs weren't sore the next day, but we have a much easier day ahead of us exploring Donegal more by car and not so much foot. We first visited an easily accessible waterfall named Asaranka, which is located just west of the town of Ardra. At an impressive 312 feet, this is a very pretty waterfall. Just imagine what it looks like when it's frozen. A little further down the road was the Mahra Strand, home to a gorgeous beach and tons of sea caves you can explore if the tide is low. This place was so much fun, and I felt bad that Terrence was not into them at all. Daddy don't like caves. <laughs> you don't like caves? Yeah. Just got this feeling it's gonna fall. Seriously, I had no idea. The things you learn about your family when you travel with them. The idea of this rock, these millions of pounds of rock, just all of a sudden deciding at that point in time that they're going to collapse and fall on me, is a thought that I have when I go to games. So it's just, it's just, Brian wants to build houses in there because he's secretly Batman. When Brian went to Ireland, let my people go. <laughs> I was also still sunburned. Just awesome. I could have spent all day here, and it was really nice that the place was not crowded at all. Terence continued walking the length of the beach while I continued to explore several more caves. Eventually, we reconvened and headed back to the car. Where's the good crack? Cut. <laughs> Behind you. Crack means a good time in Irish. After that, we headed back east to the town of Ardra for breakfast at Charlie's West End Cafe. There, I decided to try a vegetarian breakfast with a tea and a scone in honor of Greyhound. She's obsessed with tea and scones and would fit right in among the Irish. We then popped into the corner house for a quick pint, inquired about a few locals I met last time, and then headed out again. Destination, Glengesh Pass, meaning the Glen of the Swans. This high mountain pass runs between the towns of Ardra and Glencolum Killa, and it's just stunning. The road is narrow and winding, and you can either pop to the side of the road for a good look, or park at a viewpoint up near the top for a fantastic view of this valley carved by rivers and glaciers. 
Our next spot was Glen Columkilla, located on the western coast of the Sleeve League Peninsula. We parked right in front of the Folk Museum and first checked out the Stones of Ada, which is a sculpture containing stone from each of the counties in Ireland. Greyhound and I visited the Folk Museum last time when we were here and definitely recommend it. We then proceeded to Glen Columkilla Beach, which is very pretty. There's a Napoleonic signal tower on the mountain in the distance too, and many walking trails. From here, we wheeled around the peninsula to Malinbeg, catching a sight of the Rathlin O'Byrne Island and its lighthouse, and soon another Napoleonic signal tower. We found a spot at a fishing pier and got out to explore further. The views were pretty amazing as I continued along a path before passing through a pasture of sheep poop to check out this bad boy up close and personal. What's even cooler is you don't need to imagine what their purpose was. Over that way to the north is the signal tower we just saw in Glen Columkilla. And then across the sleeve leak to the east, right at the end, is the one we saw from the boat tour yesterday. It doesn't seem like that's far. it's that far away from where we parked. And then you're looking for your brother and he's this little ant. And you're like, I didn't realize it's like half a mile that way. And he only left like three minutes ago. Like this guy's trekking. Like. Brian O'Toole. Gonna light the torch of Gondor. Set the signal fire. Let them know that hope is alive. Just around the corner is easily one of the coolest beaches we saw, known as the Silver Strand, a horseshoe-shaped beach with a long set of stairs, 174 steps to be exact, that you can head down. You don't have to head down, but come on, who gets to do or see this every day? While there were people enjoying the beach, and some even getting in the water, I was still surprised how it wasn't very crowded. I guess you can say that for most of the country, to be honest. Given where we're from in New York, this is how we expect some beaches to look. That beach was very cool. And that was, there was people at the beach hanging out like it was 85 degrees out. Like, yep. That was a summer day for them. Yeah. I'm sitting there going, what are we doing? I mean, like, yeah. Well, yeah. Like, look from that water. After you're done, just remember, you have to head back up those stairs. And here are some sheep. I will never tire of the statistic that sheep outnumber people in Donegal by three to one. And if those stairs worked up your appetite, they did for mine too. So we headed to Donegal Town and had dinner and a pint before heading back to our accommodations for the night. For our next day in Donegal, we decided to head to the other side of the county. This also provided Terence an opportunity to do his favorite thing, driving. Ireland is known for its rolling hills, its picturesque countrysides, its grand greenery, and it's all true. Other than cities like Dublin or Galway or Cork, or even its smaller towns, you've got eye candy seemingly everywhere you drive. I was having a blast driving. Oh yeah. And there was times because we're on the opposite side of the road, opposite side of the car, I had opportunities to scare the crap out of you. Yeah, you did. Um, Taking me real Willingly, close. if you were pissing me off. <laughs> yeah, it's true. This is the Guiburra Bridge. I'm sure it's important for some reason. I half joke. What we're looking for, in all honesty, is a mountain. A mountain a part of a series of other mountains called the Seven Sisters, but so distinct so grand, so stark, you'd be blind to miss it. It's called Edigal, and at 2,464 feet, it's the tallest peak in Donegal and is considered a place of worship. I would love to hike up that one day. Made of a mix of schist and limestone with a quartzite top, it supposedly changes colors throughout the day and contains some of the oldest rocks in Ireland from six to 700 million years ago. We were content just driving around it and checking out the different views. Eventually, we pulled off into a small parking lot at the base of Edigal to check out the Dunluwy viewpoint. Here, you can take in the views of Dunluwy Loch and the Poisoned Glen, which is either named after a one-eyed giant killing his son or the mistake of a tarcographer. Take your pick. 
Our next stop was maybe my favorite spot of the day, the Greenan of Eilich, a stone ring hill fort atop Greenan Mountain in the Inish Owen Peninsula. Constructed in the 6th or 7th century, with 15 foot high and 15 foot thick walls, this place was awesome. Because of its height, you can see three total counties in addition to Loch Foyle and Loch Swilly. To me, that was like, if you're a little kid, that place is the coolest place because you've got all the little nooks and crannies you can hide in. And you can see everything, you run around in the perimeter. The you outside. can get into the different elevations. It's like this stone stairways that were barely, it was just rocks. Yeah. Like, it was, yeah, it was cool. All right. One of the problems I always have on vacation is that you can't be everywhere all at once. And this place, with its panoramic views in every direction, I think I would have loved to see at sunrise or sunset. Maybe another time. For now, we're briefly heading over the border into Northern Ireland to the city of Derry. Our destination, the Derry Walls, the only remaining completely walled city of its kind in Ireland. Built in the early 1600s, the walls extend for about a mile around the now inner part of the city, and you can walk around them and through several bastions. There's a bunch of cannons, and by a bunch, I mean, like everywhere you look. You don't endure two sieges, one that's 105 days long, and fire upon James II without a bunch of cannons, right? Somewhere down there is where Bloody Sunday took place some 50 years ago. Yes, the one you two sang about. That is St. Eugene's Cathedral, the Roman Catholic Cathedral in Derry, referred to as the Mother Church. This place felt really old, and I know that's probably a cliche, but you really could feel it here. We soon experienced a light random drizzle and decided, you know what, grumbling stomach? It was time for dinner. We made our way back into Donegal and continued enjoying the beautiful drive. We soon arrived in Ardra, where we'd fill up at Nancy's. Greyhound and I had been here a few years ago and had some great conversations with the locals. Thinking of you, Chris and Peter. Nancy's doesn't really feel like a restaurant. It's more like a home that's open to the public. The food is delicious and of course goes well with a pint or two. I wound up getting some seafood chowder and a prawn sandwich. I remember the food quite fondly from our first time, and the feeling hasn't changed any. Soon back in Duncanealy, I gave the other pub a try and had a lovely chat with the owner and a couple of patrons. It was time to leave Donegal. But before we left this glorious county, we had a couple of stops to tick off the first of which was just 15 minutes from where we were staying, St. John's Point. A narrow peninsula extending out into Donegal Bay, St. John's Point is home to a pretty beach and a lighthouse. It seemed like a nice place to relax, but the weather wasn't exactly inviting us to swim. Although, when is it ever here? Touch the water, even in summer, and you'll know what I'm talking about. Ireland summer, baby. Those dudes are in wetsuits. The real disappointment came when we found this closed gate to the lighthouse. We later found out it was unlocked and you can pass. Our next destination is one of the oldest towns in Ireland, Ballyshannon. We'd love to tell you about its fine pubs, restaurants, and culture history, but we did something far more important. We visited the Rory Gallagher statue, erected in honor of the greatest guitarist you've never heard of. A soulful blues singer, a virtuoso, a rock god among rock gods, the almost Rolling Stone, and a guy whose life was cut far too short. Although we missed it by about a week, every year Bally Shannon hosts an international tribute festival in his name. Mr. Gallagher, what do you think of that? You're no longer sleeping down at the laundromat. If you can't pay homage, throw on some tunes on while you drive around this. Our next spot, Ben Bulban in County Sligo, was actually inspired that very morning. There was a picture of it in Duncan Ely. So our, our, 
our accommodations in when we were in Donegal, where we were staying, there was a picture on the wall of it. Um, oh, it's I remember just, that. We, we drove around it for a bit, and then we found like a little park where uh, the trailhead begins, and you can walk around it and all that. So I don't think you can go up top. I don't remember what I googled, but it was likely Flat Green Mountain, Ireland. And that's how I found out that it wasn't very far from where we'd been staying. Apparently, it was formed during the Ice Age when Ireland was under glaciers. Just a beautiful sight. And just like that, we just missed it. Is it raining in Ireland? Eventually, we found ourselves in County Mayo, about an hour from our destination, an evening ferry ride to an outlying island called Inishturk. We still had a few hours, and so we decided to grab some lunch in the town of Westport, at a place called Anfile. Before we arrived, we saw an ominous sign, with clouds covering the top of the nearby holy mountain, Croke Patrick. And yup, it was raining. The town was very congested, and there was seemingly no parking. Until we found a spot just 30 or so feet from the entrance. Lucky us. Just missed it again. Some seafood chowder from the nearby Clue Bay, some delicious mussels. I felt pretty fortunate that we were always eating at places near the ocean. While it had stopped raining when we left, that was pretty short-lived. Croke Patrick was now covered in clouds again. And no sooner than we arrived at our next spot, the rain suddenly stopped again. You really can't make this up. It was this ruins of an abbey um, that was right across the trail to Croke Patrick, which is, you know, holy pilgrimage kind of site, barefoot, walk up to the top, you know, kind of mountain. Murrisk Abbey was a monastery established in 1457 and is believed to be the original site of a church founded by St. Patrick. Today, much of the original monastery is gone and all that remains is the central aisle of the church itself and some of the friary buildings. In addition to the outlying cemetery, there are also tombs inside of the church. It's kind of creepy, but that could have been partly because of the gloomy weather. This was a very nice view of Clue Bay. We were here long enough to get a clear view of Croke Patrick, so that was nice. We then headed to what we thought was the old Keygiver Abbey. Keygiver Abbey was just a cemetery old ruins of an abbey there were some old tools that were that were buried there so we went there there may have been some ruins of the old abbey over there but we weren't sure as we headed to the ferry at runa pier i genuinely believed our luck had run out over a week in country and there was no way we weren't going to get poured on as we sat in the waiting room all sorts of randomness popped into my head would the ferry even be able to leave would i get seasick where would we stay if we couldn't get over to Inishturk, or we had overnight lodging for a few days? As with everything, though? We just missed it. <laughs> we just missed it. So here we are at the pier waiting to go out there, and the mainland, it was on the news. Yeah. Like, this wasn't even, like, their normal rain. This was, like, biblical rain. And here we are, oh, getting, on a, here we are getting on a boat going, and, like, and it's, like, escaping it. And we're going to like the well, wind sunshine and rainbow. Like, did you guys, you guys get hit by the rain we were like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, there was more than enough room in the inside cabin in case. These seats on the top of the ferry were obviously not popular. The ride itself, once we started pulling away from the mainland, was fantastic. It took about 50 minutes and it was beautiful. We got another great view of Croke Patrick sitting prominently in the distance. Definitely adding that to my list of hikes for a possible next time. You'll also get to see two uninhabited islands. Kaher Island, where there are ruins to an old monastery on the other side, and a smaller island called Ballybeg. Eventually, we arrived at Inishturk, just nine miles off the mainland coast, with the sun peeking through the clouds. We then met Mary, our amazing bed and breakfast host, who took our bags and others to transport in her car up the hill and headed up ourselves to the Ocean View house, where we'd be staying. After settling in our room, we made our way to the community club, the communal heart of the island. While two O'Toole's celebrated their 50th anniversary, we partook in pints of Guinness and cider at the bar 
and chatted with locals and visitors to the celebration. That was the start of, I would start everywhere drinking a Guinness and then I'd immediately switch to cider. Cider, 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 cider. They were so good. Orchard Thieves, that's the name of the company. Can't get it in the United States. Still chasing that dragon. This beautiful, fruity, effervescent, crisp, not too dry. It was, for me, the start of a love letter that has now become Ciders. Eventually, we made our way back to sleep. Up before breakfast and with Terrence still sleeping, I decided to take a walk to a place I'd been to before. When Greyhound and I were here a few years ago, a good portion of our trip was largely unplanned. And while we had picked out plenty of spots and hikes beforehand, we relied heavily on the recommendations locals gave us and were rewarded for it. The Black Taxi Tour in Belfast is brilliant. Rathlin Island across the Giant's Causeway, absolute must. Oh, you're an O'Toole? Inish Turk is filled with them. Check out Mahra, the beach and caves are stunning. Oh, you reenacted Ulysses on Bloomsday? Finnegan's Wake is better. Talk to the Irish long enough and you'll find that they have no shortage of opinions. Love to chat, are kind almost to a fault, are always good for a joke, and genuinely want you to have a good time. Find the good crack, as they say. They are a marvelous people. And that's how we found ourselves on Inish Turk, and that's why I'm back. I soon came upon the shrine, known as the Tale of the Tongs. Representing centuries of families who've come and gone from the island and whose names appear on glass throughout the shrine, the Tale of the Tongs was constructed by American architecture students in 2013 as a spiritual place for the global Irish diaspora to rekindle their heritage. Historically, when someone emigrated from Ireland, they'd place a burning coal or piece of turf into a fire using tongs with a promise one day to return. For me, Having visited five years ago and now being able to return was and always will be a humbling experience, especially seeing our family name, O'Toole. The fact is, I'll never know my ancestors, the ones at Powers Court, in the Wicklow Mountains, in Glendala, or the Glenavie Mall. Nor will I ever know of being driven from my home, to Hell or to Connaught, to places westward like Inishturk, or to Cork in the south, hundreds of years ago. I'm just a kid from New York with an Italian mother and an Irish father. They all came over on boats to Ellis Island, and now I have an unhealthy obsession with pizza. If I ever go to Ireland again, I would always like to make sure that I visit that shrine on Inishkirk every time I visit. Just chilling on the road. Yep, what you doing back there, buddy? Huh? Time to head back, because it's time for breakfast. Terence and I soon went downstairs where Mary made us a full Irish breakfast that was so delicious. Because we had skipped dinner last night, we were pretty hungry. Unfortunately, Terence had some work stuff to take care of, so I decided to head out again. The weather was unfortunately not as pleasant as it was just a short while ago. This is a good time to mention that your two feet are your primary mode of transportation around the island. There's no car rental, and if you want to ride a bike, you'd better bring it along with you on the ferry. After heading past the pier, I found myself at another familiar place, Karan Beach. And while I got lucky that the tide was out, this is something you should be mindful of if you're looking to relax here. High tide is not your friend. It's a really peaceful cove, and I highly recommend it if you're just looking to relax, which I did for a bit. After Quran, I continued on what's called the loop walk. This is the Tranan house, the other bed and breakfast on the island. Shortly thereafter, I reached the community club, and right in front of it, a gated path down to my next destination of Tranan Beach. Well, hello again. I've now seen more sheep today than people. This is a lot farther to walk down to, and is a little steep on the way back up but it's very worth it. After passing through another gate, the beach will be all yours. Or mine, really. Like Koran, I hung out here for a while. Croak Patrick in the distance, 
the beautiful Connemara Mountains, just stunning views. On my return back up, no sooner than I reached the community club did I hear and feel rain coming. One pint of Guinness, please. The rain was hard but brief. The beer was excellent. And before long, I was on my way again. You may be asking yourself though, as the skies continue to darken and random flecks of drizzle drop around me, why do I continue to tempt fate? Why not just relax in the community club with a few more pints? Why not go back and check to see if Terrence is ready yet? I wish I could tell you, but for now, Port Dune, home to a small lagoon, is just ahead. The remains of a 19th century Viking fort, a pier that you can jump off of during high tide and swim in, a once popular hideout for pirates and raiders. Port Dune is a really cool little place. While it was the island's first harbor, this narrow entrance really is only accessible by small boats. I can see why they upgraded. I can also imagine pirates hiding here. No, George Harrison. Here comes the rain, do do do. And here's my place to hide. I was good to go, thank you very much. After waiting it out for a bit, I headed around the loop path more inland where I came upon the community activity pitch. For an island with a population of only 50 or so, I can't really imagine many games being played here, but I was told that there's enough people who return to play a few scheduled times a year. Pretty cool. At this point, I've reached a small freshwater lake called Loch Kulinik. Remember the tale of the tongs? Right beyond the lake. If you remember the signs for Clare Island at Runa Pier, that's Clare Island in the distance. Oh, and remember those signal towers we saw in Donegal? That's one atop Mount Knocklochan. It was at this point that I decided, let's take out the drone and get a better look. The signal tower was likely built in the early 19th century, and numerous towers dot the mainland coast of Mayo. The shrine looks really cool from above, too. Equally beautiful was the path back to the inhabited part of the island. And while I'm a little nervous about flying over water, at least there was a possibility I could retrieve it if it took a little dunk. And just as I was making a really nice pass above it, I heard this awful sound. Time to land and time to run. The shrine was calling. And what happened was is there was this horrible, torrential rain. And it was on Father's Day. And I'm sitting there at this shrine staring at this glass the plaque of, of our name. It was a very emotional thing to be there on Father's Day, uh, to not have our father there, um, this pouring rain, and it was just this very spiritual, reflective, meditative place. And I was just kind of like, all right, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I don't feel like getting wet. I haven't got wet this whole trip. Uh, why change it? Can always count on me to find cover. <laughs> I was there for almost an hour before I was able to leave. Making a run for it. The calm before another storm. Eventually, I returned to the Ocean View house and cleaned up, relaxed for a while before Terrence and I went out for dinner. This community center is the restaurant, the meeting place. It's, I'm sure that they use it for town hall meetings. It's, it's everything in all, all in one. You don't normally, you don't see that a lot of places, you know? It was a cool place. The food was pretty good too. The fried brie wedges and especially the crab claws were on point. And someone on this island likely fished them up today. Can't beat that. And while I decided to head back to the bed and breakfast, Terrence hung back into the wee hours of the night to play pool with one of the bartenders. The following morning, after a light breakfast, Terrence and I headed to the shrine together. Whoever decided that this was a good place for a bench, give that person a raise. Today was an exceptionally nice day, unlike yesterday. And while there would be no more terrible surprises, there were definitely some good ones. But you were walking on the path and they were like 50 feet to our left. Oh, what you doing buddy? And I turned my head and all of a sudden they're right in front of us. These horses were so beautiful. And honestly, if I had asked Terrence beforehand if he thought he'd be petting horses on a morning walk, 
something tells me he'd think I was crazy. I was also surprised, to be honest, that we saw two people and their dog. I really hadn't seen anyone except for at the community club and the bed and breakfast up to this point. While Terrence explored the shrine for the first time, I decided to take in the views. Also, side note, a lot of sheep poop. Before long, it was time to explore the other half of the island, the rugged and untouched part. Terrence would meet me back at the community club. There will be a trailhead sign and you'll see trail posts along the way. Otherwise, it's pretty straightforward. Just head up, head west, and take in the rugged beauty ahead of you. You'll get a nice view of Loch Kulanik behind you too. Not sure if this small body of water has a name. If you're planning on only visiting Inishkirk for the day, heading this way will take up quite a bit of your time. Eventually you'll reach the western edge of the island where you'll see the sea stacks known as Little Brother and Big Brother, or Buchelbeig and Buchelmore in Irish. There was a little bit of sunshine rain as I approached, and you know what that means. A rainbow. Of course I had to see a rainbow. And while there is a barrier to keep you from falling off the edge, you know I wasn't going to take that chance. See previous section about fear of heights. The views are simply incredible, and there was no one there but me. Between a large portion of the Sleeve League and this, it was hard to think of any other point on this trip where I was by myself. I soon began heading back across Inishkirk, which, by the way, means the Island of the Wild Boar in Irish. Maybe it's just a coincidence, but the O'Toole family crest is a white lion over a red emblem with a wild boar at the top. Oh yeah, and as I made my way back, I felt like there were way more sheep than usual. Maybe because there's rarely people out this way and they feel more comfortable, I don't know. I eventually reached the community club where Terrence and I decided to have a late lunch, early dinner. Can't go wrong with toasties, chips, and beer. We chatted with some locals, enjoyed the nice breeze and views outside, and eventually made our way back to the Ocean View house. You could do nothing but just hang out with the people there and have the great you experience. Have you have a great experience in Ireland. And with that, as we eased into the evening and prepared to leave the island tomorrow, I'll end the day with this. Thanks for the hospitality, Inishturk. It was second to none. After eating breakfast, we soon made our way to the harbor to catch the ferry back to the mainland. We said our goodbyes to Mary and we're soon on our way. Schlan, Inishturk. We had beautiful views of the other outlying islands and nice views of Croke Patrick, although over the course of the ride, it did become covered in clouds. Eventually, we arrived back at Runa Pier, got in the rental, and started our way southwards. Destination, the Cliffs of Moor. The ride was marked by pouring rain, picturesque scenery, a sheepdog herding, ruins of buildings, and buses. Wait, buses? I kind of forgot what was about to happen. Massive parking lots, fee booths, tons of people. It'd been a week or so since Dublin, so this was a jolt back to civilization. Yes, there are people in this world, and they are here at one of Ireland's top tourist attractions. Eventually, we made our way across the street, past the gift shops and visitor center, and to the cliffs themselves. Extending for nine miles along the wild Atlantic Way, and rising roughly 700 feet from the Atlantic Ocean. These cliffs are pretty majestic. We decided to head up the right side first up these long set of stairs, where we also checked out O'Brien's Tower, a stone observation tower built in the 1800s and is the highest point at the Cliffs of Moher. If you head around the tower, you'll see that the path goes on for quite a while. That's because there's an 11 or 12 mile cliff walk in both directions. We won't be doing that, since it can take four or five hours, but we will check out the other side. Up a small set of stairs, and there'll be a viewing platform. That sea stack is pretty cool. Overall, a very beautiful place to visit, but... Uh, tourist trap. Yeah. You want to be a tourist in Ireland? Go to the Pussy Moor. Very pretty. Gorgeous. Why? A million people. 
There are so many other places in the country that are gorgeous mm. that you can also get to. If you're not into crowds of people though, I'd say this maybe isn't the best place for you. Also. Hey Greyhound, what's this mean again? It means that if you're holding a seagull, you, uh, you can't walk on fire. That's what that means. And with that, we begin heading to Mallow, a town you may not be familiar with. That was the last known place that our family lived in before coming to the United States, to coming to New York. Of course, rain. We soon arrived at the Hibernian Hotel, where in addition to escaping the rain, we checked in and had some food and drink at their downstairs restaurant and bar. Afterwards, we set out on a special mission, exploring the area our family was last known to have lived, on Beecher and Lower Beecher Street. We had no house numbers, no stories passed down through generations, no way to determine the exact house. Was it this one or that one? Could this house fit them all? Were these even the original homes from over a hundred years ago? We go to the street from where our family last lived. Yes. I felt a more, more of a connection to the O'Toole name in Inishter than I did that street. Well, it's time for a pint. We chatted with a few locals, one of whom I didn't even realize at first that Greyhound and I had met five years ago. And then went out again, briefly visiting the fire station where a great granduncle had worked as a firefighter. The next place, the Mallow train station, was very meaningful. I'm pretty sure rail in Ireland has improved over the last hundred years or so, but once upon a time, maybe right here, our great-grandfather worked as a railway signalman before hopping on a boat back and forth to New York, bringing the entire O'Toole family with him. And just like that, two random guys started up a conversation with us. We were walking from the railway station back to town. They had gotten off the train, and they were like, what are you guys doing here? Da, 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 da. And they brought us to their favorite bar. They yeah, had one, already been drinking. Yeah, one of them was fully in the bags. That was the only conversation we had with people that we were talking about being Americans in Ireland. Yeah. Their view on Americans in Ireland, their view on Irish people in Ireland, and then everybody's view on English people in Ireland. That night, I fell heavily asleep. Continuing with yesterday's theme of, where are the O'Toole's? We headed to the city of Cork, home to one of the largest natural harbors in the world. Our mission, take a boat tour and check out a very important place in our family's history. Gotta say, this is giving me custom house vibes in Dublin, which is funny because here's the abandoned custom house at the port of Cork. We then boarded our naval accommodations for the next two hours. The tour itself along the River Lee and Loch Mahon was a great mix of history and sights, with a heavy emphasis on shipping. We saw tons of freight ships, flour mills, and even a brewery. A boat club with some old Irish Curragh boats and even some rowers alongside us. This was the village of Blackrock, and nearby it, the Blackrock Castle. After locals requested assistance from Queen Elizabeth I to repel pirates, Blackrock Castle was constructed in 1582 as a defense fortification. It now serves as an observatory, visitor center, and restaurant. We soon entered into Loch Mahon. That is the Ardmore House, once the home to Captain Richard Roberts, the first to navigate a steamship across the Atlantic to America in 1838. That little tower over there is called a folly, Essentially a structure built with no purpose but to demonstrate wealth. Get it? Over this way is an area known as the Dockyard, for obvious reasons. That seaside village is Monkstown, with its prominent church towering over everything. Apparently all the bananas in Ireland come from that ship, which just arrived from Puerto Rico. After heading around Hall Boleyn and Spike Island, we turned around to check out the real jewel of this tour. Formerly known as Queenstown, this is the village of Cove, which gained its name after the Irish War of Independence. That was where 
that our family took the boat to New York. On October 18, 1900, our great-grandfather boarded the Majestic, and later, after returning to gather up the rest of the family, they all boarded the Teutonic on August 5, 1904. Some 12 years later, this was also the last port of call for the Titanic. On our return ride back, we checked out Black Rock again, passed more freight ships, and continued to enjoy the nice day. And before long, returned to the port of Cork. We soon found ourselves in Thompson's Restaurant and Brewery, where we enjoyed a flight of beer tasters and some delicious food, before heading out on a scenic drive west to County Kerry. This is a really good time to explain something that we've been doing since getting our rental car in Dublin. We've been eating at gas stations, or petrol stations as they're called here. Whenever we didn't have time to sit down, we'd buy pre-made sandwiches from inside. By no means glamorous, but it kept us, and me especially, from getting hangry. We soon arrived at Cronin's Yard in the McGillicuddy's Reeks, which is not only the highest mountain range in Ireland, but in whose center is Cotton Tool, the highest mountain in Ireland. This is essentially a starting point to ascend to the top of Cotton Tool. Well, hello there, you lovelies. No intention of hiking to the top today, since it takes about six hours, but maybe another trip. Cotton Tool means Tool Sickle, which you won't be surprised is anglicized as O'Toole, or Descendant of Tool. If you didn't think we were going to catch a sight of something with that name, you haven't been paying attention. It was so beautiful. It's very rare to see places in Ireland that weren't beautiful. After soaking in the views, we decided to head back to Mallow. Just a quick note that there are bathrooms, a tea room, and you pay two euros to park when you exit. After a pint and some grub back at the Hibernian, we tapped out for the night. So long, Hibernian Hotel. We're headed to the Wicklow Mountains. The driving, as you would imagine, was beautiful as usual. We passed through many counties, Limerick, Tipperary, Leash, Kildare, and finally Wicklow, eventually making our way into the Wicklow Mountains the ancestral lands of the O'Tools. First of all, the driving. Driving through this area just felt epic. The rolling mountains, the winding roads, green everywhere. It was just magnificent. Eventually, we reached Glendalough, Irish for the Valley of Two Lakes and home to a fantastic 6th century monastic settlement founded by St. Kevin. Before our ancestor, St. Lawrence O'Toole, became the Archbishop of Dublin, he was the abbot of Glendalough. After parking in the lower car park and checking out the visitor center, we began walking along the green road, but not without seeing this adorable little deer. Our destination, that church in the distance. The green road is part of the Greater Wicklow Way, an 81 mile path through the mountains. Before long, you'll arrive at the monastic city and see St. Kevin's Church. Built in the 12th century and named after St. Kevin, the founder and first abbot of Glendalough. Towering over everything is the Round Tower, which was used as a bell tower, a beacon for visiting pilgrims, a refuge for monks under attack, and a lookout tower. This is the remains of the St. Peter and Paul Cathedral, the largest structure in Glendalough. We found a grave slab of one of our possible ancestors here, and also a few headstones in the cemetery throughout the monastic city. Over here is the priest's house, and this is St. Kevin's Cross. This really was such an incredible place. And now, to check out the two lakes. Oh, I'm going to go to I told you we could go. We were going to go to the lower car parking lot, go to the monastic city, then drive to the upper parking lot and see the lake. And he starts walking, and I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna go with this. And we're walking, and we're walking, and we're walking, and I can see him getting a little pissed off. This is the lower lake, by the way. And then when we got up there, you're like, there's another parking lot here. And I'm like, I told you that. You're like, 
No, you didn't. I'm like, I, I promise you I did. And you're like. <sighs> the view of the upper lake is hard to describe. A stunning glaciated valley from ancient yesteryears. A peaceful spot to meditate and reflect. A sacred place that's been here long before you and will be here long after you. There was such a strong feeling of unperturbed presence. Nearby is the path through a small grove to the remains of the Reefert Church, built around 1100 and now a burial site. Many descendants of St. Lawrence O'Toole are believed to be buried here, including many princes. There was also a very nice waterfall called Pulanas up a path as well. On the way back, which was just as beautiful, we checked out the last ecclesiastical gateway in Ireland. It was how the monastic city was intended to be entered, through this double archway, which originally was a two-story structure. And with a light drizzle beginning, it was time to head to our next spot, also in County Wicklow. Named as one of the best gardens in the world by National Geographic, and also the home of a former medieval castle inhabited by our ancestors, the Powers Court Estate and Gardens has possibly one of the best views in Ireland. You think of any historical paintings or any depictions in movies and stuff like that of, of an estate on a rolling hillside, this is it, right? Yep. You're standing up top and then you're looking down multiple tier, tiers of curated landscape and gardens and fountains and there's a lake on the bottom and even at the bottom, the, it's set in between these mountainsides and yeah, it was just a gorgeous. picture perfect place. You know? Yeah. Um, Turning around and looking back at the estate itself was quite a thing to witness too. And below, with gates flanked by winged horse statues, was Triton Lake, an absolutely stunning sight from different angles. We then proceeded to a place just a little bit away called the Killing Grove. There, 80-year-old clan chieftain Philem O'Toole found himself alone and surrounded by the English, and ultimately met his end. This is the last of our land our ancestors got yeah. head cut off. was a little upsetting. Uh, it, just yeah. shows, it just shows you how history went. People yeah. just went, the O'Toole's and the O'Burns. And I'm going to kill you and that's mine. You know, that's the way that's that a, works. That's how that works. <laughs> it's like, killed you, it's now mine. Yeah, what are you going to do about it? You're dead. Nearby is the Pepper Pot Tower, formerly a scout tower, which gives you nice views of the Great Sugar Loaf. But given the growth of many trees, isn't this useful as a scout tower these days? After heading back down, we headed across the main terrace to check out the beautiful flowers, plants, and shrubs before entering the walled garden with a fountain at its center. We also checked out the dolphin pond. Unfortunately, we had arrived to Powers Court only an hour before they closed for the day, so we couldn't explore too much else. Time to head in Dublin, where we look forward to sitting in traffic. This is the view from Dublin traffic, isn't it scenic? Eventually, we arrived at the Glasshouse Hotel in Tollacht, our last spot for the next couple of days before we leave. We picked this place since we planned to do a bunch of stuff outside the city, so why not stay on its outskirts? It was time to head downstairs to the hotel bar and restaurant for some beer, brisket burgers, chips, and wings. You know, the healthy stuff. I'm actually shocked at the, uh, how good chicken wings are in Ireland. <laughs> Yeah, because we got them in multiple places, and we were yeah. all every single time we we're like, "This is really good." You guys are really good. Yeah, this is really good. It's really good. It's really good. And I gotta say, the finger balls to clean your fingers is something I wish we had back home. We'd been watching the football game and suddenly heard cheering from outside the hotel bar. Our bartender informed us that they were playing right outside, which I've never experienced. And so, during a post dinner stroll to help digest. Can you hear that? The Irish team must have just scored. And with that, we folded for the night. We woke up to a super crummy forecast of rain for the day. And I kind of screwed up a little bit for tomorrow. I had gotten us tickets to Kilmainham Jail on his birthday, and I had kind of an idea for his birthday that like, hey, dude, let's go to jail. Just... Not in a good way, like we partied and got blacked out and ended up in a jail. We wanted to be there. 
I didn't realize it at the time, two weeks earlier, but I was like, oh crap, I gotta make it up to him. So there was a movie theater that was near our hotel and we wind up seeing The Flash and super comfortable seats. Was there anybody in the theater with us? Yeah, it was there was like maybe like one or two other people, but- It was one of those movie theaters that's in a mall. Terrence loves movies, so it just made sense. We then headed for a late lunch, early dinner at the Brass Fox Bar. Naturally, I got a Guinness or two, or 18, and Terrence got his now favorite Orchard Thieve cider. More tasty wings, lightly battered shrimp. Owner was super friendly. Yeah. He took the time, hey, where have you guys been? He was telling us places to go. They Real close to where we were staying, still. Yep. Walking distance. We then made it an early night since tomorrow was going to be an early day, although we did unsuccessfully try to find a hurling game. Hurling, older than football slash soccer, an ancient Gaelic sport that is yeah. rough and tumble and kind yeah. of insane. Fastest game on grass, they call it, but we couldn't find tickets. Yet. Yeah. Not only was Terrence's birthday the only day I could snag Kilmainham jail tickets, I could only get them for when they first opened at 9.30 a.m. Yeah, I'm sure he loved not being able to sleep in. Sorry, dude. But happy birthday! Kilmainham Jail, by the way, is a former prison and execution site of many Irish revolutionaries, and now a monument to Irish nationalism and independence. While we waited outside, we checked out the proclamation sculpture across the street that honors the leaders of the Easter Rising. The blindfolded and faceless statues circle a metal engraved stand of the Proclamation of the Irish Republic. On each statue is inscribed an execution order and have bullet holes in their torsos. Alrighty then, let's head inside. First placed into a courthouse while we waited for our guide, we were soon shown a holding cell next to the courtroom before being brought into a courtyard for a briefing on the museum. We were then led into the Catholic chapel where prisoners attend mass every Sunday and may have been the only place and time that isolated prisoners would see anyone else. This is the chapel where Joseph Plunkett, one of the signatories of the Proclamation of the Irish Republic, and Grace Gifford were married in 1916, hours before he was executed just outside. The West Wing, the oldest part of the jail, was built in 1796 and consisted of 79 cells. When first constructed, this wing had no lights, heat, or windows. This is the landing of the West Wing, where the leaders of the Easter Rising were held before they were executed. And in this cell corridor, Amon de Valera was imprisoned for the second time during the Irish Civil War. Here's the cell of Robert Emmett, a rebel leader from the 1798 Irish Uprising. And this is the famous East Wing, with 96 cells in all, Built in the 1860s and used in many movies, such as The Italian Job, Michael Collins, and Paddington 2. Remember Grace Gifford? This is her cell, after she was detained during the Irish Civil War and painted pictures of the Blessed Virgin and the Christ Child on the walls. Up top, you'll see Amon de Valera's first stint in Kilmainham Jail. He later became Ireland's third president and second prime minister. This is the Stonebreakers Yard, where in 1916, 14 leaders of the Easter Rising were executed. Saddest place in the country. Yeah, for sure. A plaque below the Irish flag commemorates the terrible occasion. There are two crosses in the yard, marking where the executions took place. This cross marks the spot where James Connolly was executed. Connolly wasn't ever held in Kilmainham, but in Dublin Castle due to injuries. Despite only having a day or so to live, he was brought here on a stretcher, tied to a chair, and shot to death. Up to this point, the public hadn't really supported the revolution. These executions, Connolly specifically, caused so much anger and further fueled the fight for independence. Afterwards, we checked out the exhibits in another building, in particular, a copy of the Proclamation of the Irish Republic. And now, ramen time. It's Terence's birthday. Ramen is his jam, so eating it was a no-brainer. We found a place in the Stony Batter neighborhood of Dublin called Ramen Co. But the yeah. ramen was good. It was a tiny little place. Yep. 
Brian was a little bit of a tourist waiting outside like a... a, a I was a, hungry. A happy puppy. Right not, outside. not a tourist, knew, I'm hungry. You, Duck ramen. Mmm. We then hop back into the rental and headed out to the countryside for one last excursion. Our first destination, Three Castles, which was just north of the Liffey and west of the Wicklow Mountains. Three Castles, that was a joke. There was only one castle that was half torn down. Well, there's this dude named Brian O'Toole and he destroyed it. What am I supposed to do about this? <laughs> You know, I mean, like, he did a good job. That's true. <laughs> we then proceeded to head through the northern part of the Wicklow Mountains, which, again, is such a gorgeous place to drive. We essentially stopped at three small lots along the side of the road to check out different views of what's called Loch Tay, informally known as Guinness Lake. And it's funny because you, you describe it, right? And then we You're go like, off to it. It looks like Guinness, really? And yeah. We go, oh, yeah, it does look like a. Yeah. Our next spot is in the town of Wicklow, the Black Castle. On the eastern side, on a rocky promontory, lies the remains of this castle that was constantly under attack by the O'Tools and the O'Burns. In 1301, it was destroyed almost completely, and today is a great place with beautiful views. Just south of the Black Castle is Traveler Hawk Beach, where St. Patrick and other monks attempted to land in the year 432, but couldn't because a local tribe was throwing stones at them. We then returned to Dublin for some dinner and opted for the brass fox again. Fried brie wedges, prawn tacos, lovely Guinness. And then, good night. We're leaving today. That's how it goes. Bags loaded up, heading to the airport in the rain. Guess who didn't drive once? Not once. That guy did. As with any trip, it's always bittersweet to leave. At the end of the day, I'll never know St. Lawrence O'Toole, Lord Phelim O'Toole of Powers Court, or my great-grandfather, Dennis. I mean, I never even met my grandfather, but I do know my brother. For me, the most important thing about this trip was going on it with you. Not just re-experience, which I wanted to, those sort of family things, but to show you them. You know, when we were in that boat cruise, this is where they left, right there. This is where our great-grandfather worked, right here, you know. Also, um, Guinness? We have Guinness at 9 a.m.? Because <laughs> it's the last Guinness you're going to have. Yeah, yeah.